Mm-hmm. Good. Hi, hi, Julia. How are you doing? Good. You're fantastic, man. Good to see you. Let's begin if you're already. I will just give a quick introduction of Christina and then we will be able to move through. So we're going to go on three, two, one. Good afternoon. Welcome to this Caribbean Youth Dialogue. We want to acknowledge the presence of uh, youth leaders of Caribbean higher education. We want to welcome their presence. We want to acknowledge you who are in the audience, and we want to thank you for participating in this discourse. Recording in progress. UNESCO ESL has been engaged in a series of public consultations as it seeks to formulate um, positions, declarations with respect to critical issues confronting Latin America and the Caribbean. This is building on the declaration from Cordoba, Argentina in 2018 of a regional higher education strategy plan. We want, as agreed in Cordoba, to review, to investigate any issues that may be pertinent and to build on that. And so, Chris, the conference for regional education plus five will be held in Brasilia in March 2024. This afternoon, we are delighted to have youth leaders who will speak to the topics related to the consideration of Caribbean higher education. We have had a series of public consultations in which we have looked at the general future of higher education in the region. We have looked at financing higher education. How do we engage in appropriate strategies for internationalizing higher education? Looking at issues of sustainable development of, of higher education systems within the context of our character, which is small island developing states. We have also considered the critical issue of decolonizing. We have shared a shared history of colonization, albeit from different contexts of, 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 of Europe. However, we do share this idea and desire to move beyond the structures, the epistemologies that we have inherited and to be able to define the way forward. This afternoon, it is the time to hear the youth. And we have as our moderator, Christina Williams, who continues to help to contribute to the transformation of education globally as head of the advocacy and partnerships portfolio for the Commonwealth Students Association. She's also a member of the UNESCO SDG4 network. Her regional insights are primarily attributed to her time as immediate past president of the Jamaica Union of Tertiary Students and former president of the Guild of undergraduates of the Mona campus, the University of the West Indies. She will be joined by way of her panelists by Miguel Machado, who is president of the Latin American and Caribbean Continental Organization of Students and member of the National Secretary of the Cuban University Student Federation, Zaka Toto, who is a PhD student at the University de Antilles in Martinique, he is pursuing his program in political science. He is a grant recipient who has pursued study on the basis, of, and he's a founder and director of the Martinique cultural magazine, ZIST. Donia Golding is a college ambassador of the Barbados Community College, assisting new and existing students throughout their stu studies and helping to promote the college. Ariel Alexis, attends T.A. Marshall Community College in Grenada. He is a member of the student executive. She's a member of the student executive council, beg your pardon, and serves as chair of the resources committee. Geneve Richards, who is a student leader here and a voice for transformation on the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies. Ms. Williams, over to you as you lead us through this exciting dialogue. Thank you so much.
uh, before actually I actually went to France for, for my graduate program and afterward. Um, so that is my experience. For me, it's, it's life-changing uh, because it's a, obviously a cheaper option and also it represents, it's very like, it democratize, democratize uh, basically the access to, uh, to uh, higher education. And I think it's very important for the development of our islands uh, that we have solutions that we have access uh, to programs, to universities, to colleges uh, close to home. Could you hear me? Thank you so much. Yes, okay. I can hear you. Yes, thank you so much for that. I will okay. bring in Dania from Barbados. How prepared were you to begin your studies for higher education? Um, I have to be honest. I would say that we were very well prepared from high school, but then there's just some things that you can't be prepared for. But in general, my experience at Barbados Community College has been ups and downs, but it has been very impactful. And I would say it's helped me to be the person I am today. So, yeah. Thank you. I love these very to the point answers. All right, Ariel, what about your experience? Well, similar to my other panelists, um, it was the most practical option, the community college in Grenada. It's free right now. So it just made sense to go there. It is. It has been filled with ups and downs as well. But I would say personally, it's more ups than ever. I've really enjoyed my experience at TA Marshall Community College. Thank you so much. And Miguel, my friend from Cuba, he and I have constantly communicated via WhatsApp. This is our first time seeing each other. So I hope he remembers my face from my WhatsApp photos. Miguel? Yes, good afternoon. I'm very, I'm very happy to see you this afternoon, and I'm very happy to get to share this space with you to talk about the Latin American and Caribbean reality. So to go back to your question, I think this is a very interesting question. This is my fifth year in the university, and let's say that it's been a life-changing experience, and I actually accessed this after finishing my high school, and it was right after the COVID, which, or right at the moment of COVID, which was a, a very important moment, but we managed to get out of this situation. So we learn different ways of teaching, we learn different ways of learning, and we managed to continue moving forward with our studies. So it's been a wonderful experience, a wonderful university experience. And again, I'm very pleased to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. And just for clarity purposes, when it is that we have another language on the platform and for whatever reason you don't speak that language, you're able to look at the interpretation. There is a, a button at the bottom of the screen that allows you to hear it in English or in Spanish. So for my colleagues here who are not bilingual, I speak Spanish somewhat. Um, you are able to hear it in either Spanish or English throughout the session. So just want to note that for everyone here. All right, so we want to take our, our audience into the mix because you know we're all a family here this afternoon. Everyone is sharing their insights and we're going to launch our, for, our first poll for our discussion. And the poll looks at what words would you use to describe your experiences in interacting with the academic, administrative, and ancillary staff within your institutions. And the poll is in front of you, and I'm inviting everyone, including my distinguished panelists, to also respond to the poll. And just a note, I can see whether or not persons are answering. So please do. We have three minutes to respond. Just a few words. Um, for some reason, I'm not allowed to type an answer into the poll. Mm. Yeah, same, same here. It says that hosts and panelists can vote. Cannot vote. Yeah. I am not sure the technical team can fix that. Hopefully they can. But while they're working on that in the background, I'm asking everyone else to please 
answer the poll, but I really hope that our panelists are able to answer because we do want to know their opinions as well in regards to this question. If not, we'll have to take it audibly. All right, I'm going to ask again to, to, to see if we can have our panelists answer the other polls coming up, please. That would be great. But I'm going to take a few words from them audibly now. I will start with Miguel. What words would you use to describe your experiences in interacting with the academic, administrative, and ancillary staff within your in institutions? And after, after Miguel, I will take Dania. So for this one, I'd say, I'd say something very simple, but it being this interaction with the institutions and with the students and with the sealer and service, I think it is very important coordination, the coordination for the success with any kind of process that you undertake in the institution. It is also important to the integration and also objectivity in order to achieve all of the different objectives that you may have from your different standpoints within the institution. Thank you so much. He used the word coordination and I agree with that. Coordination is so important in execution, implementation, in how it is that we work with students and other stakeholders within the institution. So I agree with him there. Um, Dania, what are your words or word? Uh, for me, I would say it's been pleasant, um, somewhat organized at times, but challenging also. Challenging also. Do you want to say a little more? Um, as I was saying, organizing at times, sometimes not all of the staff are on the same board or the same level. So it's hard to get across your roles accurately and efficiently if everyone is not on the same wavelength. But that happens in the minority more than the majority. All right. Thank you so much for sharing, Dania. Ariel, what about you? What are your words? I'd say my experience with the staff has been a good one, there's been willingness to help. They've also been organized. Again, there is there's still area for improvement in terms of, I would say, synchronization, the flow of it all. But overall, it has been a good experience for me. Okay. And Zaka? Well, I, I don't have much to add. Uh, I think it's key that... Uh, yeah, I think it's key that, you know, the process of you know registering and going through your your studies is very important because um, for young people, I think we can get quite lost, um, you know, in the in the process, in, in the classes or, you know, how to choose your program. So, of course, like to have a better flow within within the organizations, I think is tantamount. All right, thank you. So I'm hearing some similarity there. I want to bring Genevieve into the conversation. You were able to answer the first question, so I'm going to bring it back. Were you prepared for higher education when you started um, UE? Uh, and as well as your words to describe your experiences, with the different arms of the university. Contrary to what everyone would have said before, I was not prepared. I was very much unprepared I was thinking where I'm going to live the financial burden that comes with it and how am I going to integrate into the space so those were some of the challenges that I would have been considering before entering higher education and the word that I would describe um use to describe my just my experience would be helpful and sometimes on the end it can be strenuous like just the whole processing process of getting some things done can be very long and tedious so I know you said one word, but I gave you three. <laughs> well, we said word or word, so you're completely fine. Uh, and I love the 
the nuance that you brought to the conversation, because I know across the region, we do have some of our students that are well prepared, some that are somewhat prepared, and then some that are not prepared at all, especially because of maybe their high school situation at the time, uh, maybe their community situation. And it shows the importance of having robust support systems for our tertiary students to ensure that everyone, regardless of background, regardless of high school, in Jamaica, we have this term traditional versus non-traditional high school. I'm not sure what you may have in Martinique or Barbados or, or Cuba, but what we find in Jamaica is that because of the disparity between some of our, our secondary institutions, students who then transition to higher education may be not as prepared as others because of their high school backgrounds. So that's just a note to put there. Um, and so it's important for us to have those kind of robust systems that includes policies that will ensure that all our students are at a particular standard for higher education. I'm, tr I'm trying to share the results of our poll. Are you seeing the results? I am not seeing the results. It says that it's being shared, but I'm not able to see or to read it to you. I'm not sure. It says 100% answered. Yes, but you're not seeing the, the responses, are you? No. Neither am I. So I'm going to add that to the list of things that Technical will be helping us with shortly. Right. So that my panelists can vote in the polls and we're able to see the responses here and we can discuss them. So... I want to ensure that I've gotten everyone into the conversation with the question that I just asked. Yes, everyone was able to respond. Good. So we're going to move now to another area of discussion. Just give me a second, please. All right, so we just talked about experience, preparation rather for higher education and as well as how it is that we interact and we experience power structures in our institutions. So I want to hear a little bit now about student participation in governance and management of institutions. How was your experience, what was your experience like when you were or you are, because some of us may be former, some of us may be current, um, student, a student leader, or you're involved in a club or society, what was that experience like interacting with the management of your institutions? I will start with Genevieve. With Genevieve. Why am I calling you Genevieve? I, I should be punished for that because I know your name and we've known each other for a long time. Genevieve, go ahead. What was your experience like? Can you just repeat back the question for me, please? So I can... Sure. As a student leader, and we know that you have held many hats at UE, past and present, um, what was your experience like being a student leader and interacting with management of the institution? So being a student leader, when I was a student leader at the at UA, for me, it was a very exciting experience because at that point, I could now use my voice to represent the concerns of other students. Sometimes, though, while interacting with management, I had to be very assertive and firm in my stance because sometimes you're seen as a student. So you're, sometimes your opinions and your thoughts aren't really regarded in high regards and you want to be no, you want them to know that you're very serious. So you sometimes have to bring some assertiveness. But apart from that, most times they do listen and they take the concerns because they do want to integrate young people voice into whatever they're doing. So sometimes they do take the concerns and they play and they put it into perspective and you can see change from there. However, there are some times when you have to be a bit more assertive to ensure that whatever you want to get done will get done and have to like follow up with management. That's what something I realized I have to follow up. I have to be persistent to ensure that the changes were made. All right. So we're talking about a blend of assertiveness, 
as well as diplomacy, using these different channels to have your concerns or rather your colleagues' concerns aired. All right, what about you, Ariel? As a student leader or just as a student getting involved in your institution? Um, well, being a part of the student government in my school, I have to say that the management has been enthusiastic and willing to help us. There is a bit of a red tape at times, so there just needs to be coordination and organization on our part and theirs. But with teamwork and willingness, I think we, we get it done. I like that end line. We get it done. All right. What about you, Dania? Are you getting it done in your institution or is there a red tape preventing that? I would definitely say it's a mixture of both because as Jennifer was saying, there is always a certain stigma that goes with students and having a voice. So perseverance definitely helps, but also being an ambassador for BCC, I have had so many opportunities. So it's more positives than negatives. All right, thank you. Zaka. Actually, I think I think a lot a lot has to be done in in Martinique and, and Guadeloupe in terms of uh, uh, participation of the students in the in the in the university life. Uh, I think I consider it having studying abroad. Like I think it's kind of non-existent. Uh, basically, students are there to uh, follow uh, what's been decided by the upper echelon of the administration. I don't think there is enough, you know, uh, democracy involvement or participation into the decision of the university in general or into the, the strategy of the university in general and uh, for me it's definitely something that is that needs to be that needs to improve all right so we so we note that there is definitely some need for improvement Dania, what about your experience Um, I just answered just now. Oh, you just did. Apologies. <laughs> Apologies. No problem. <laughs> All right, Miguel. Sí, bueno, en, en nuestro caso... well, in our case, there are many different experiences in the coordinated efforts that we've done with the uh, Federation of Students in Cuba uh, amongst the different decision making moments that without a doubt have some representation in what, whatever we do. That has allowed us to help everyone understand what we understand by this democracy and how important it is, this student movement and how this movement is part of the community and that without their participation, without this student participation in the different university processes, it would be impossible for many of these processes to actually happen. So our experience has been quite positive in that sense. We've had quite an active participation in those different decisions that are made in our universities because we've had a lot of representation in all of the different boards and we have a lot of representation in each of the instances that our uh, institutions have in our country in order to address the policies of education in our country. So for us, it is very important to actually uh, watch for the, what the movement does in terms of the decisions that our universities are going to make because we're part of this community and we want to enhance and we want to improve the development of the different university processes and of course the future of each of the students in this community. Thank you so much Miguel. I love how he talks about being a part of the community and the need to be meaningfully engaged and involved in all the processes. He also talked about being a part of a number of different boards uh, in his institution. And I think that like, for example, the UE Mona campus or overall the UE system, University of the West Indies is a good example of that as well, um, where it is that the members of the guild of students or rather the guild council, uh, they are able to sit on a number of different school boards. When I was guild president, uh, at UE years ago, uh, I was able to a number of different uh, school boards. Certain decisions could not be passed without the vote of the guild president, which of course represents the vote of the students. And I think that was a really powerful example of how it is that students are meaningfully engaged in the higher education system. 
And, and of course, I've heard, like, for example, from Zaka to say that, you know, there are definitely some marked areas of improvement. And I think that even in the spaces where we have mature interaction or mature meaningful engagement, there's always still a need for, for improvement because sometimes you find that there may be a particular administrator who is really gung-ho to work with students. And then another person may come and that person may not be so enthusiastic. I think it was Donna who spoke about the enthusiasm of, of, of our institution uh, in terms of wanting to work with students. Sometimes that's absent. So I think it's important for institutions to have, and I think that's what uh, Miguel was hinting at as well. It's important for institutions to have something written to say that students must be engaged. That way we don't have to rely on the willpower of our administrations, but we will always be protected by the university charter. Is it the student union constitution to ensure that we're always at the table and we're always meaningfully engaged. But when we talk about meaningful engagement, there's always a sore issue that comes up. And I'm sure some of you are going to agree with me when I say that the, 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 the title or the topic. It's campus safety and security. It's one of the, I see Ariel nodding her head, yes. A lot of the times when we talk about student leadership, student governance, and we having our student leaders represent the students and bringing issues to the fore, one issue that always come up, it came up in my time, it still comes up in my time, even though I'm now working at the Commonwealth level, is campus safety and security. And what measures can be put in place at the institutions. So I am going to have the poll at this time so that our audience can share their insights with this. How satisfied are you with the current campus safety and security measures in place at your institution? But I'm, I also want to hear from our panelists. Question though, just let me check. And I'm asking one of you to do it for me. Can you vote now on the poll? Can you vote through the poll now? Yes. You can, awesome. Okay, so the poll is running. And I really hope I'll be able to share it and you're able to see the responses because that's also an important part of this exercise.
All right. So just a note, I'm going to ask technical team to just run the polls for three minutes, each poll for three minutes going forward, because I'm sure my audience or my panelists need five minutes. I think, I think we're all chomping at the bit with our answers and ready to give our feedback. So I will now share. Well, it is sharing, but I'm still not seeing the responses. Am I, am I the only one not seeing the responses? I'm not seeing the responses. Nonetheless, we'll, we'll, we'll work through it. We'll work through it. Um, we do want the polls to still be, still be done because we want this information to feed into uh, the conference that's going to be held in Brazil 13th to the 15th of March. So it's important that we have this poll. But I do want to also be able to discuss the answer. So I'm going to have my panelists to just give me some of their feedback here live. And I'm going to start with Danya because I want to make sure that I remember that I asked you this time. <laughs> so what has your experience been like working with administration on campus security? Um, and do you think that more needs to be done in, in that regards? Honestly, I have to say that Barbados Community College is spot on when it comes to security. There's a guard everywhere. There's always the drills that we take to make sure that the students are aware of what we have to do. So the only thing that I would say there's room for improvement in is consistency because it's it lacks here and there. Mm, okay. All right. And I like I like that you mentioned drills. May I ask, is this in regards to natural disasters, those kind of drills like a fire, etc.? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay. I'm intrigued by that. And I want to also hear my my the other panelists speak a little bit about that in their response because I've heard students complain, particularly in Jamaica, that they don't get a lot of exposure anymore to drills. And we had a number of earthquakes recently in Jamaica. And we know the Caribbean is, is hurricane prone, it's earthquake prone. Um, you know, we are affected by climate change. I could go on and on about that by itself. Um, and so it's important that a part of the security measures of our campuses involve how we respond to those kind of shocks. Thank you, Dania. Let me ask Janine, which I'm sure has an interesting answer for us. Janine? So personally, there I think there is so much more that can be done. I'm speaking from the perspective of you and Mona. It's a huge campus. So therefore, it sometimes may be hard to like streamline security. But talking about drills now, personally, like during my experience, we didn't really have much drills, but because of the recent earthquakes that would have been experiences, I see that there has been some, there has been some way to like get more drills done. So persons, so different halls and different faculties, they're doing more now because of the recent surge of earthquake to have more um, drills within the classroom and outside of the classroom space. However, I do hope that they keep up with it. And it's not just because of the recent earthquakes that would have experienced. So I do hope it's it will it will be continual. Regarding security, no, there is need for improvement. A lot of students complain about not feeling safe on campus. There are a lot of dark areas um, that are prone to like robbery. And just if we live here, I think there needs to be an overall safety. So they have been doing um, work in sense that they have this app called Rush Alert in which students can download to feel safe and they're this product launch of like a panic button. But in regards, it's a huge campus so there needs to be more done so that not just a segment or a sector feels safe, but everyone feels safe. That includes off-campus students as well. All right, so we're talking about comprehensive security plans that looks at on and off campus students and particularly for institutions that are large, very large campuses, tend to be porous, tend to be found within communities that may be uh, volatile communities and that students are at risk. So I think as you as you mentioned, Jenny, correctly, those are important um, things that any institution needs to consider. One of the things that we have heard a lot um, that comes out, not just at the local level, but also globally, the development of safe communities around higher education institutions, uh, they, they call them school communities or school towns. I hope I'm using the correct term. And 
that's actually something that's recommended. Um, I remember when we had the Global Declaration that came out of Transforming Education Summit 2022, um, the um, students also suggested that they needed to have more safe communities around their institutions. And that's something that Jamaica, I know for sure, have also discussed um, almost every election cycle. So I really hope that's something that we can finally have at some point. Ariel, what about you? Campus safety and security. I have to say my college, they they do what they need to do in terms of security. There's a security at every gate. If you don't have your school jersey on, you must have identification anytime you move in and out of school. In terms of drills for natural disasters, I would say they are lacking in that. I haven't had a drill since I've been in college. And I don't think I've heard of anyone else having a drill since. So I think improvements do need to be made in terms of that, yes. Zaka, what about you? Well, the, the situa in terms of security around the campuses, um, I mean, the situation is not dire, in, whether in Martinique or Guadeloupe, but um, I think that for sure, like after a certain hour, um, you know, you cannot hang around that much. So most definitely there's something to be done in that regard. Um, you know, it's a different culture as well. So, you know, French campuses, like French-speaking island, uh, we don't have the same, you know, uh, let's say, um, kind of openness to the campus or the size of the campus. Uh, so usually what happens a lot is that, you know, people tend to go home after classes. Uh, but I think the I, the question of security is linked to that. It means, you know, the grounds of the university are, are, are left, you know, uh, wide open uh, usually at night. Uh, so from time to time, there can be some troubles, but usually it's still pretty safe. Now, in terms of drills and, you know, related to all the natural risks that we have, we also have volcanic in Martinique. So, you know, the, the old lady might, might erupt one day. Uh, I don't remember any, any drills in the last few years. So um, I think that's definitely an aspect that, that we need to, to be more involved in. Uh, you know, it kind of need to be uh, entrenched in the culture of our students, of our administration of our of our of our university in general and it might be lacking a little bit okay that's definitely important volcanoes you definitely need some drills <laughs> no, i expect you to yes. go home and advocate for that <laughs> <laughs> all right miguel what about you campus safety and security measures at your institution bueno compañeros yo en ese tema comentarles que en nuestras eh, universidades son completamente seguras, tienen super seguridad y creo que ahora me conecto un poco con lo que comenta el, el, el otro compañero que recién concluyó con la participación. Esto de seguridad también va preparado, unido a, a simulacros para desastres. Nosotros en nuestro país no somos afectados por desastres eh, directamente como en Apologies. In terms of, we have a very good um, measures of security, but for, for drills, for earthquakes, I believe that within our educational system, we have the possibility for students to take part in promoting and preventing for hurricane uh, in the Caribbean, which are the, it's the majority of affectation that we have in our countries. In our organizations, we seek for students to contribute to the security of the university campus, not directly outside the campus, but within the, the rooms and the places in halls and places where students live. So we have student guards, we have experienced this in our country, that allows us to have complete security within campus, more and over the, what we can get from the personnel that is destined for this. All right, thank you, Miguel. So I think what Miguel is communicating to us is how we can play our part as students and student leaders in sharing certain information with our colleagues. So in terms of the drills, in terms of what to do during a particular disaster, 
we also have a part to play as student leaders because we do have a platform. After all, a lot of us are elected. We're in the roles because the students believe in us and have given this, this opportunity to serve them and their interests. So the Miguel is also highlighting how it is that we can do our part in terms of campus safety and security measures. But I think it's always important. We have to work together, student leaders with administration and vice versa. I'm staying on the campus security point a little longer because I think there's another aspect of campus security that we tend not to talk about too much, which is more how individual um, students feel when we talk about safety. So yes, we have the institutional safety, you know, are there enough guards? Are there enough gates? Can students come on or not? Well, other individuals come on or not. But what about harassment? Students being harassed, whether it's sexual harassment or otherwise, um, do we feel that there is redress in that regard? Do students feel safe to report certain instances? Um, do they even know where to report? Um, you know, is there a support system around that? Do students, when students are in the space, do they feel physically safe? Do they feel mentally safe? And if there has been harm to their well-being or, or their welfare or risk of harm, is there a channel that they can quickly access and get assistance? Do we feel that? I see Zaka shaking his head, so you're on the spot. <laughs> uh, you, you, you're making me do, uh, do a bad reputation to my university. It's terrible. Uh, I, I don't, I think, uh, so in terms of harassment uh, and in terms of, you know, the, the security of, of the, the ladies in, in general around the campus, I think there's there's an issue. Um, just recently, I think what I'm, so I'm, I'm also teaching uh, as a teacher, as a teacher assistant in, in political science. And uh, I think one of my students was complaining that she was getting harassed around the campus. Every time she would leave campus, um, you know, around 6 p.m., you know, when it gets dark. Um, and I don't think there is any resource that I, I I only remember that I could, uh, you know, uh, tell her to go see uh, the, the the assistant, but there was no uh, specific institution or uh, someone in charge of that within the student body. Uh, and and uh, yeah, so it's a very pertinent question because it makes me think of a, of a lot of like problems and possibly solutions. Um, yeah, I'm I'm I don't think it's it's a good thing on our campus. So I'm hearing that there definitely needs some improvement there in Martinique with your specific institution. I'm going to have Miguel answer now as well. I believe that in this case, we have mechanisms for denouncing in case any student suffers aggression uh, through the security personnel, for example, or by the security personnel, or if they have been harmed within the university, but we have had, we know uh, that in many countries of our region in the Caribbean and Central America or Latin America, that this happens a lot, that the security personnel in some occasions, instead of giving security, they become a threat for students and that generates a, a situation that there isn't a, a place where they can uh, attend to or go to if there is uh, such a situation. As youth, we also have a responsibility more and over the responsibility that the administration has and that the public force of an, of an educational institution has. We have to, in, in our position of leadership and student government, we have to be able to achieve a strong stand against this type of activities or actions in our universities. And we need to generate exchange spaces for uh, our colleagues who are being harassed, for them to be able to come to the, the um, to the ombuds people or the people in charge of defending students within our organizations. This could help. There could be security, but in universities, but if the security becomes a problem, 
when they're harassing or committing aggression against their students, then we're talking about real insecurity within our universities. All right, thank you, Miguel. I think Miguel brought in an interesting aspect of the conversation just now when he talked about how it is that the systems within the institution that are supposed to provide security are the, the well, what becomes a threat to students. And we see that happening in instances where we have student protests, for example, and the students are protesting uh, at their institutions. Sometimes it's peaceful, uh, but then they are oppressed. The student, the, the students who are advocating for themselves and advocating for their fellow colleagues are oppressed by university um, forces or by government forces. And that's an aspect of um, campus safety and security that we tend not to discuss as well. It may not be a big deal in some of our Caribbean nations, but I can tell you that in other parts of Latin America, as he mentioned, it is a big issue where we have our student our student leaders aren't able to fully advocate for themselves because they will be physically oppressed um, by security forces. So thank you for bringing in that part of the conversation as well, um, Miguel. Um, Ariel, what about you in terms of campus harassment, redress for um, situations of that or other things? I mean, it could even be that when students are physically threatened, ha um, have a fight, bullying, whatever, do we see redress? I must say in terms of harassment and bullying, I wouldn't say there's a specific channel that's available for reports or address. I think that's one thing our college has to improve on because whilst I haven't heard any complaints about harassment specifically, I have heard complaints about bullying and I, I'm not aware that they had to go, there was any specific channels for them to seek any solutions to that, no. All right, it's important to note, Donna. Um, I would say I have not personally experienced harassment or bullying, but the school does offer services for persons who are facing these challenges. However, that's where us as the student representatives come in to represent these services and promote them because not everyone is comfortable or not everyone knows about these services being offered. So we really have to step up and pull the weight of those who don't have a voice to speak about issues they're facing like these. All right. I love that. Once again, bringing in the role that we can play as student leaders. All right. Thank you, Dania and Jenny. For that, I we do have systems in place, like we do have like campus security, the police security. But to my knowledge, I don't think there is a space for students to um to go anonymously to voice their concerns or if there's any issue. I don't think we have that at UE Mona. Additionally, even though we have some of the resources, sometimes it's very hard to access those resources. For example, if you're probably going through trauma, you need to get access to the health center, then there may be a backlog, which then your wait time will be longer than usual. So yes, they are. we do have resources, but I do believe that we can improve and then we can offer more services so that students can feel safe to report and students can have an environment in which if something happened, they can report an anonymously without having the fear of someone is going to find out and expose their name. So I do think that those are the areas that we need to work on so that students can feel safe and whatever happens, they can report without any harassment being made to them. I love that. There must always be some kind of whistleblower protection in place for our students. Agreed. And you see how it comes together. We need to have a full um, institutional framework where students feel physically safe, but they also feel safe in terms of the policies and the redress channels that are in place as well. All right. So I want to round out this section of the conversation by talking about finance. But we know that finance is a big, is a big topic. So I'm, I'm, I'm splitting it into two and asking for your responses into. So when you respond, you respond to both sides of the of the coin. In terms of personal finances for students, do we feel as if our students are supported adequately, whether it is by the institution itself or 
how it is that government support these students within the institution, with their personal finances. And then the second part now is about the institution's governance structure in terms of its finance. So is it using its finances appropriately? Is it spending on what it should spend it on? How do we feel our institutions are using the finances? Do they need to do more to raise capital? Whatever your, your, your insight is in that regard. So we're looking at student finances and we're looking at the institution's finances. And I am going to start with Geneve. Personally, I believe that more can be done in regards to like transparency for um, student finance in the sense that I believe at the university, I know that you can post everything or to share all your financial documents, but if students are paying tuition fees, we're paying different fees, miscellaneous fees, fees, I do believe that there should be some platform in which students can go to see, okay, this is how the money is being spent and this is what is going towards. There needs to be a level of transparency. Additionally, university ed experience is extremely expensive. Higher education is expensive. There needs to be more financial aid for students who want to access higher education. I think of it as an investment so we probably can have more private sectors coming, aboard, coming on board. We can have international organizations and to raise awareness that higher education is expensive and students need to get support and help, even if it's like some bond, some bond scholarships, because I do not they, I do know that they have that. But additional to that, student leaders, they play a part in ensuring that this information is communicated to students because there's a lot of times that you do have the financial aids, you do have different donors, but the students don't know of this. And if you don't know of it, you'll be ignorant to it and then you cannot access those resources. And so there's a divide with the information regarding like financial aid. So I do believe that more needs to be done in promoting and encouraging students because there's also a stigma surrounding financial aid as well. Some persons believe that it was looked upon. Um, so there needs to be like some form of campaign just to ensure that students feel comfortable. It's okay, it's safe to get financial aid because it's there for you. All right, thank you so much, Geneve. Nicely wrapped their transparent structures um, from the universities in telling us how it is that they spend the monies um, that they have received from the different channels, which includes um, tuition fees. And students need, well, there needs to be greater awareness around financial aid for students and to destigmatize financial aid. Dania, what insights do you have? Finance for institutions as well as for students. I would say for the institutions, um, it could be managed better. And I agree with Geneve in terms of transparency, at least to a certain level, so that we don't always think that, oh, our money is going to something else besides our education. Also for students, in terms of financial aids, even though we're not paying as much as university students, some students still need that extra help or extra boost in terms of getting school supplies and paying for their programs. Also with student activities, student, uh, I forgot the word, but having activities that involve students, I feel like students always look towards recreational things that they can do to not only attain but de-stress and I would say we could always improve on that because there is not enough events improving and including students so yeah I would say those financial stuff would definitely be helpful. Thank you so we're looking at not just tuition fees as well but um, as you said there the supplies the students need to use I'm guessing you're, you're, you're referencing a little bit to campus hunger um, and as you said, to all, for universities to invest more into initiatives that will provide, uh, I guess, some kind of space for students to de-stress, have some relief, um, I guess, from the rigors of, of school. I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, Ariel, what about you? Um, I'd say there's no complaints in terms of personal finances for students. Um, the college is free as of last year. Ah, uh, yes. That's, yes, that's on the government's part, thankfully. So actually that opened more avenues for more students. We saw influx of like a larger volume of students coming into the college. So that's a good thing. So in terms of in institutional finances, I must say maybe that's ignorance on my part or on their part for not being transparent. I won't say I know where that finances is going. 
I'd appreciate more if we knew where exactly. So that that's what I say they need improvements on. Thank you. Um, and I, I will use what Ariel just said, just to, to put up my placard to say we need free education, but I will move over. I'll move over to my colleague, uh, Miguel, who has free education in his country as well. Miguel, what are your thoughts in terms of supporting students with their finances, as well as how institutions should treat their finances? Well, I think that in that sense, in that particular sense, it is important to say that in our country, we have some funding that is uh, heavily addressed to higher education. So here we have a specific budget that is addressed to this means. Actually, this year, that budget was increased for higher education by understanding this, how important it is that uh, the state understands that young people and the university is nothing but the future of a country in terms of research and innovation. So that's why it is important to have this guarantee that the government has for these uh, institutions, for these higher education institutions, in order to fund, in order to cover all the expenses that are coming from these institutions. I mean, in that sense, it is very important because you have this uh, financial support for those students that given some circumstances may need some, let's say some greater support or the need to actually cover their needs because they are part of some, let's say, vulnerabilities or they're part of some vulnerable populations. So that's why there are some plans that are going to enable students to access these aids in such a way that they can actually access education. And there are also some other people that are going to support these students so they can access these aids. And so they can actually figure it out in terms of what they need to do up to the moment they finish their studies or up to the moment they decide to. So it's important to see how they acknowledge our financial situation. And it, of course, depends on the budget that our state, that our nations are allocating for teaching, for at the higher education, so our universities manage to develop themselves. And I think it is very important because we know that there are some other places in which we don't have the same reality. And there are some Latin American brothers and sisters that are telling us that their situation is completely different. And they might not have this support, this financial support, uh, or they might have a limited support. And this is of course going to impact the, the way they access education and of course, it is going to impact the real funding that they may need. And on the other hand, it is important to have these financial aids that are going to help the most vulnerable students so they can access these opportunities, so they can access bonds, so they can access scholarships, or they can access some sort of alternatives so they can access uh, universities or they can access these higher education institutions so they don't have to interrupt at their own processes. All right, thank you. So we're, we're hearing that balance again about having transparency. Another um, case study right there about free, edu free tertiary education and how it is that their budgets have increased. Um, so fingers crossed that more governments will look to Cuba, will look to Barbados to see how it's important that if we want to drive research and innovation, as Miguel said, just know we need to invest in the students in our higher education systems. All right, so I'll bring in Zaka to close out this question. Uh, Do you have free education can, over can, there, Zaka? I can only concur with my colleagues. Um, most definitely, I think transparency and accountability needs to become part of the culture of our universities and colleges. Um, I think uh, in our case, it's not something that is usually done. Um, and, and most of all, well, just to maybe add a little touch, um, higher education should be seen not as a cost, but actually as an investment, as an opportunity uh, that actually pays back. Um, and that would be, I think, uh, one of the strongest arguments to advocate for a free education. Uh, in the last few years in Martinique and Guadeloupe, actually the cost has increased. Um, and some of the students actually uh, face difficulty to, to feed themselves sometimes. So 
uh, we definitely need to work on that and make universities and, and higher education more accessible uh, for, for everybody. Thank you. I'm just going to add this as a as an aspect where in which our audience are able to interact even more with us. There's a Q&A function as well. Aside from the polls, there's a Q&A function. And so even though it's a Q&A function, I'm asking that if you also have suggestions and insights to share it using the Q&A function, I can readily read it and we can pull in what you're saying as well into the conversation. So going forward, also use the Q&A function as well for the questions that are not, that we haven't posed using the, that we haven't posed using the poll. <laughs> yes, I'm having a tongue twister right there. All right, so we have rounded off the aspect of governance um, in our higher education institutions, and we're going to move now to another aspect of things. And it will be done through two poll questions. So I'm going to ask for the first poll to be launched. Only two minutes, just two minutes for this poll because it's, it is two polls. So we'll ask for the first poll to be launched for two minutes. And this poll looks at how satisfied are you with the representation, support, and opportunities provided for women within the academic environment? So we're having this go for two minutes. So please run into the poll and give your response. And what I will be doing going forward, I will have technical share the responses on screen. So we'll now be able to see the responses and we can discuss. So for my panelists, you won't have to verbally share, but we'll still discuss it together. So let's go, let's see those answers rolling in. We have 40 of us here today, full house, big family this afternoon. So yes, all persons can complete the poll. All persons are able to complete the poll. So please go in, all 40 of us, let's complete the poll. I think it is a great question. A lot of times we don't really drill into these questions in these kind of settings. So. I'm really happy to see this type of questions coming out uh, by UNESCO ISL. I'm gonna give us an additional 30 seconds because I see some of us are still taking a little time to answer. So I'll give us, I'll give us an additional 30 seconds. So I'll give it two minutes, 30. So you ended up getting three minutes. So we're going to go into it now. We're going to have the poll launched so that we can see some of the responses coming in. And technically, you want to assist me with that. How satisfied are we with the representation, support, and opportunities provided for women within the academic environment? 
And there will be a question for men coming up soon. So you don't have to worry. My um my men on the call. Um, there will be a question there specifically for you as well. So we're seeing where persons are saying that it's very for sin difficult artists. Um, it's very difficult. Um, someone is saying that they're satisfied. I'm reading some of the Spanish. Um, they're very satisfied. Um, women have a lot of opportunities. Um, medianamente, I think that means somewhat satisfied. Yes, if my Spanish is working on the ball today, they're somewhat satisfied. Or English is saying very satisfied. And then I see Ariella says um, that there, there are not specific opportunities for women. All right, so let's see. In Cuba, different opportunities exist for women and men, mm -hmm. but they're equal opportunities. All right, greater emphasis is needed um, to advise students. I guess in this case would be for women. Okay, keep it right there. Thank you. That's, this right here is, is great. All right, so I am going to I'm going to bring my panelists into the conversation now. In terms of opportunities for women, do we feel that there are enough, or what more needs to be done to support our women specifically um, within the higher education space? And yes, I know that for many of our institutions, there are more women than men, particularly in Jamaica. Um, I'm not sure if it's the same for Martinique, Barbados, etc. Definitely more um, women than men in your system, but do our women still need support? Ariel, what do you think? Um, as I said in my answer, opportunities are afforded to both men and women. There isn't any specialized opportunities for women specifically. Both men and women get the opportunities and I guess the best is children. Dania? I have to agree, agree with Ariel. Um, we are equally given opportunities. However, there is still a stigma behind women and the decisions they make. So there's always that doubting spirit behind some people, which kind of, I guess it could influence the choices being made, but there's always opportunities available. All right. Janine? Personally, within you in Mona space there has been great improvement we do have like the institute of gender and development studies we have a lot of women-led organization here even though that even though there are still some stigma attached to certain choices that women make within the university spaces you do have platforms and you do have organization that sensitize and educate women on their rights and how they go about um navigating the space in, as women, we do have a lot of support groups, not just for women in general, but different segments of women. So you have support group for persons who are disabled, which are women. You have support group for rural women because their experience would be very different from someone who lives in the urban area and is within the academic space. So I do believe that we are doing a good job in representing women in academics, even in the classroom setting as well. You do find that you have um, women lecturers. You do find that there are different acti activities that are geared towards supporting and building women, especially through entrepreneurship and different grants available for women. So I would commend the university for the work that they have been doing and the government in representing women in the academic space. All right, thank you. Daniel, you haven't gone as it, have, have you? <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> okay. All right, um, Miguel. Do you think our women need to be supported more um, or is enough being done to support our women within the academic environment? I think that today women have a specific uh, space that they have, let's say, earned themselves with the different feminist struggles. And I agree with my colleagues 
and saying that we are in a society that has embraced this issue and we're not any longer in a patriarchal society because now we have many more opportunities for women at the higher education institutions and not only for women but also for men so we have managed to have let's say equitable access to opportunities but we know there are some situations that are let's say hindering this and there is sometimes some discrimination for women however i believe that we have advanced a lot in that sense and i've heard so with your interventions and in my country, uh, we have the same situation. We have, let's say, equitable opportunities for both men and women, but we must continue striving for these opportunities. But now we are, let's say, in a very equitable situation that we must continue to potentiate, to empower. Thank you, Miguel. I, I want to note quickly that I see some questions coming in. I will leave them until the end. Uh, because we have to get through some of these pre-selected questions in advance, um, but I'll definitely try my best to get those questions in before we end here this afternoon. So, Miss Gibson, Cheryl Gibson, I have noted your questions, the three of them. All right, I'll bring Zaka in now with the question in terms of are women being supported? Um, so, I concur with the colleagues as well. Um, I think a lot of improvement has been made. I think in Martinique, most of the student body is made of women. Um, as well, I think, as the teaching body. Um, however, um, it does not always translate in terms of leadership. I just looked right now, for example, uh, in the last uh, 50 years of existence of the Université des Antilles, uh, there's been 13 presidents and only two women as president. Um, so I think, you know, um, um, uh, these positions, these opportunities, these uh, increased representation, uh, should probably also um, uh, translate into leadership opportunities into uh, you know increased representation uh because they, they actually brings a lot to the shore i'm also uh, quite pleased in the last few years uh that uh in terms of for example you know uh, let's say um uh, you know um how, how do i put it um ac academic studies that are usually uh, uh more attached to men, such as STEMs, for example, or um, IT, um, have been actually most of the young researchers are actually women, at least in our universities, and they're quite brilliant. So representation are changing. I hope it does translate into leadership positions as well. I love that answer. And I think it brings together all that you have been saying, all, all of the panelists in terms of there have been great strides. We have more women in the classroom, more women having opportunities um, to get an education, higher, edu an higher education, but we still have some areas that need improvement. One thing that I would quickly add is, for example, um, spaces for women to have care for their loved ones, whether it be children or um, their elderly um, parents, because women tend to be the nurturers and caregivers in spaces. So, so reflect on it. While it is that women are being in the classroom, how are they balancing being the caregivers at home? Many times there is a lot of struggle involved and we have to consider, well, okay, yes, we want more women in the classroom, yes, they're in the classroom, but how do we provide support to them to ensure that they can also be a good caregiver or a good mother if they choose to be. In the case that a woman chooses to be that, that there's a support system in place. And I think sometimes we don't really reflect on that so much. We just think about, well, it is enough that she's in the classroom. But women should have the choice to be all that they want to be. And that involves being a student and a mother or a student and a caregiver for her elderly father. She should be able to do that. So that's something that I've always reflected on, those kind of support systems for our um, women in our academic environment. Um, all right, so for the men now, the question on the poll is, do we need special measures to improve the representation, support, and opportunities provided for men? Because you know we do see where the numbers of the number of men in our classrooms are dwindling. So do we need more support and more opportunities for our men? And do we need to increase the representation of our men in the higher education space? 
And we're running for two minutes on this because, you know, as we wind down with our discussion, we want to ensure that everything is answered today. So we're, we're, we're going to keep some of the questions really tight. So we're running for two minutes and we really hope that you respond within that time. And of course, I'll bring my panelists in. All right, another minute to go. All right, so that's our poll, and our results will be shown now on screen. And while they're being shown, technical, are we getting a look at our results? In the meantime, I'm going to bring in Donna into the conversation in terms of support for men. Any insights in, in that regard? I would say mainly for the young men, like young students, um, I don't think they get enough support because as you said, you often see a lot of females, but the males, I think there's a stigma around them in terms of, oh, you're supposed to be doing a specific skill and working instead of focusing on academics. So it's kind of like they're ashamed or embarrassed when they're pursuing an academic subject or an academic program. So I believe they deserve more support and that could come from the student representative bodies as well. All right, thank you so much, Dania. And I see someone, um, I think it's Toka, Toka Toza that talks about, there needs to be support for men from disadvantaged backgrounds. And I guess Ariel is responding here by saying that there needs to be improvement in particular areas, but she's satisfied in what is already offered. Um, so let me see if my Spanish is working here. And it needs to be more, um, more improvements to continue. All right, definitely in Jamaica, there are not enough males in the higher education space. They need more programs to promote boys. We definitely have, um, when we look at the ratio between men and women, there are definitely more women in our higher education system more than our men. So I definitely agree that, particularly with Jamaica, because I see from that context, we need more support for our boys. I will bring in Geneve, who is from Jamaica. Um, do you have any insights? how we can support our men, Janine. Yes. Um, as you said before, that the ratio is that there are more women in university than men. I do believe that it's a deeper issue than just for them to be represented in the university space. But we have to go back to the root cause. We have to go back to the homes. There are a lot of missing fathers and father, father figures and positive role models for males within the homes. A lot of times they have to take up the responsibility of shouldering their family and to take on the responsibility of being men at a young age. So we have to correct the, the home system, the family structure, the system there, if we want to see an improvement um, within higher education system. Additionally, I do believe that there is a stigma that surrounds education in the sense that there are some subjects, some degrees that are um, general, not even generalized, but they are put in a category, okay, this is a women's degree, this is a men's degree. So we need to break that stigma so that men themselves, they don't feel scared to venture into different avenues 
without the possibility of them being de-emasculated. So that is something that definitely needs to be improved on within Jamaica. So as I said before, definitely the family structure needs to be um, looked into and we need to provide positive role models because they yes, they are role models, but are they positive? Or are they leaving a lasting impact on our young men? So we definitely need to revisit that. I love that. I love that. I love how you talk about um that social support um that's well psychosocial support for our men and our boys in our education system i definitely agree and i think one of the things that our education our education system to also provide for our men and our boys is development um uh, mental development in the sense that when they leave the space they're leaving the space to be positive contributors to society beyond just oh what i can do with my degree but what kind of person am I? How do I show up in the world? Um, you know, as a as a as a as a brother, a father, if they choose to do that, or uncle, whatever the case is, as a man in the space, um, how do they show up character-wise? So I think that's also an important part of how we need to provide support for our men, particularly when they don't have good role models themselves or a good um background, as 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 mentioned by Geneve. Zaka, how do we support our boys and men? Do they need support? Yes, they do. They do. Um, so I specified that um, I was thinking mostly of people from disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, you know, from rural regions or uh, people whose family will not, you know, naturally push them uh, to, to go for higher education. Um, and I think there's a lot of like wasted potential uh, in that regard of people not pursuing studies uh, while they could um, and sometimes not specifically because of, of um, you know, money or, or means, but because they were not uh, told that it was a, a true opportunity for them and that they could actually achieve it. Uh, so I think um, there's definitely something to be done in that regard um, in our territories. All right, I'll bring in Miguel to round it off since um, Ariel did respond already in the chat. Um, Miguel? I think it is true that we can always do a bit more as to find solutions without, let's say, or acknowledging differences and having in mind that sometimes men are to be providers in their families. And in that sense, we should enhance the different opportunities for uh, men's training and in order to see the different opportunities and the different sort of opportunities they have with the different profiles, having in mind their professional development. And in that sense, I'd say that there is a lot to be done and we can also create this mindset or this culture for both individuals, both men and women, whenever we try to differentiate this term without, let's say, without discriminating anyone because of gender. So I concur with my colleagues in that sense. All right. And I want Miguel to stay on the floor because there's a there's a, a pillar that we're also looking at when we talk about men and women, but also about cultural diversity generally. And I wanted to ask the question about relationships with Latin America. So between the Caribbean and Latin America, I know that Cuba has a great relationship with Latin America, particularly because of Oclai. I was at Oclai's Congress last year. Um, in Venezuela, and it was an incredible um, experience to be there with the student leaders from Caribbean and Latin America and to see that kind of uh, partnership working between students of both regions. So I wanted to ask a little bit about how we can have more synergies between Latin America and the Caribbean, but also looking at just overall cultural diversity in our university spaces. And that question is for Miguel. Thank you. Thank you. I think that uh, we've had very positive experiences and with the student university, the, uh, the encounter or the meeting that we have last year in Venezuela was amazing. And I think it is very important to understand this, how in a region of the world we can converge, we can merge, to create a, these exchange opportunities 
having in mind our cultures, having in mind this cultural diversity. And in that sense, I think it is very important that we uh, that we continue having these relationships because our countries can actually put together these uh, student movements and we can have this opportunity such as the one that we have today because here we're, uh, let's say, coming together to talk about our different realities. And I know that many of the people listening to us today are sharing or share what we see, what we believe. And in that sense, we have a common understanding of the Caribbean and also the Caribbean as part of the Latin American region as, an, as a whole, as a total and unique region. So in that sense, I think that we could continue working on joint initiatives. And in that sense, we could actually respond to the different demands that we have in our regions and not only in our local region, but also worldwide in the sense that we, UNESCO yourself is allowing us to have a voice worldwide, specifically for the Conference of higher, on Higher Education. So there is a lot to do here. It is a responsibility. It is a responsibility to strengthen these cultural bonds in Latin America and the Caribbean, because we know that it's quite diverse, diverse and it comes from our ancestors and from the first inhabitants of our region that were the, the native um, nations, but also we have some other nations that were in these territories. So that cultural diversity that actually brought it, brings us together is something that we need to take advantage of. And I think it is key for us to manage to have the articulation of our university. So that's why I believe that the opportunity of exchanging is quite important for us to get closer and closer because this is key for, for us to achieve our objectives and to manage to have the synergies as to identify what's the future going to be like for higher education and where are we walking towards to in the future in terms of the in both individual and collective development. I think this is something that we must bear in mind the collective development of our country, the collective development of our university academy, and also the collective development of our region. And I think that in the Caribbean region, we should actually work closely together, or closer together with Martinique, with Jamaica, with Barbados and other countries. And at the same time, we should get closer to the Latin American countries as well in order to boost this diversity. Agreed, agreed. Thank you so much. I love how he put it that it's a collective development of our countries, our community, community being our regions, and there should definitely be more partnerships between Latin America and the Caribbean in advance in higher education. So we're very happy for the space provided by UNESCO ISL. ISL. Um, to bring in, well, today we're just focusing on the Caribbean, but with other initiatives, they do provide space for the Caribbean and Latin America. And personally, I look forward to more of those opportunities. And as Miguel mentioned as well, to have more exchange between the students and student leaders of both regions. So I'm going to move into the aspect of scientific development and innovation. And it's only one question for this for this section. And it's really what more do, would we like to see our universities do in advancing or facilitating innovation and development? What more would we want to see or do we think needs to be done, if anything, for our universities to facilitate um, or advance innovation and development? So I'll give you a second to just think about that for a second, because I see down your head. I can see it on her face as she's thinking. <laughs> and I am going to start with Ariel. So I would say how they'd be able to facilitate um, innovation and development is by creating spaces for those who have those ideas. I think there isn't enough space you know, to create those opportunities as well as creating programs and opportunities because a lot of people have these ideas on how we could innovate and develop, but they're not given the voice nor the space in order to do so. 
All right. Um, just, just a piggyback on that for a quick second. When you said space, do you want to tell me when you said speak what space really means um, for you? Okay, but when I say space, I mean different lectures, I mean different competitions, activities, where we basically, we promote those places for students to just express themselves in that sense. All right, thank you so much, Ariel. All right, um, Zaka. <laughs> that early, can, can you give me the, the, the question again? Sure, what more can our universities do, if anything, to advance and or facilitate innovation and development? Mm. <laughs> All right. Um, I think from the from the early stages, uh, from the first years, uh, push students to see the opportunities that they can have, you know, in whatever field, you know, how far they can go, what kind of jobs they could get, um, you know, at each level, you know, the the what this degree can can bring you or can lead you to in terms of a career and opportunity. Um, and also, you know, um, I, I will concur as well with uh, with the colleague before me uh, that um, the university should be also seen as something that uh, develops the students as as human beings, as citizens, as citizens of you know the community, but also the Caribbean in our region. And I think push more for a culture where the students also develop themselves uh, in this context. I love how you add that, um, the culture as well, because sometimes we focus a lot on just the hard technical skills and we'll talk about development and innovation, but the orange economy, yes? Um, the cultural aspect, cultural diversity needs to also be invested in and supported. Thank you for that, Zako. All right, Janine. I'm agreeing with my, my colleagues as well, and I do believe that we can incentivize certain programs that we want students to be involved in. A lot of times, students want to be at the state, but they truly can't afford that program, etc. And also incentivize in the sense that you want to promote innovation, technology, and advancement then therefore you should at least provide some sort of benefit towards the students so that they can easily participate and this can strike their enthusiasm as well. Additionally, I do believe like offer more programs. A lot, of, a lot of times we see our students migrating overseas simple because they don't have the access to the programs that they would want here. And because of that, we also have brain drain and we're not utilizing our resources here. So we can't, we have a lot of resources within the Caribbean and Latin America. What we need to do is to develop those resources and use the young minds, use the youth through STEM, through transformational development, have different programs, partner with different ministries and government agents and we can use us as students, us as young people to fix and to innovate within the Caribbean and also the Latin America space. All right. Thank you, Janine. Daniel. I have to agree with my colleagues in saying that, yes, create spaces to involve students so that they can be comfortable and they have new ideas. They're fresh. So why not get them involved and also, as Janif was saying, with more programs being offered in the Caribbean, I feel like there's a lot, yes, but then there are some students who always feel the urge to migrate internationally. So even marketing the programs we already have properly and networking, but also including more, seeing what they have that we can include in our institutions. All right, thank you for that, Dania. And to round out this question, Miguel, how can universities facilitate or advance technology, well, innovation and development? I think universities, I, I agree with my colleague, Saga. He talked about the topic that opportunities uh, and the spaces that have to be created for investigation i agree with the previous comment we are, the programs have to be generated to allow students to investigate and achieve a technological development in the different profiles of the different specializations in cuba we have the experience of the 
technological parks and the different liaisons between universities and the programs for scientific, technological and investigation, investigative programs. Something important, we have to generate investig investigative networks that encourage for these students to incorporate, uh, to study there and develop their investigations jointly. This could be networks uh, which can uh, take place inter-university academically, uh, inter-student, and through our organizations we can enroll or we can create agreements that allow cooperation between our institutions so that we can have a scientific exchange contributing to the development as region uh, with a uh, caribbean focus that, as, that we need it'd be great if we could have networks uh, for sciences and students in the different specialization areas in the caribbean agreed agreed having that kind of collaboration between um, both regions as well as intra-regionally among countries um, in terms of having networks that will advance and or facilitate innovation and development. So agreed with you completely, um, Miguel. So we're at another section of polls and this one will look at our higher education institutions addressing the climate crisis and promoting sustainable development in the Caribbean region. We're winding down, we're coming down to the wire. So we're, we have some, some hard questions to consider before we close out. Uh, we have about, we have two other questions after this. So we're, we're winding down. So I asked my attendees to stay with us. Um, we have two major questions after this. And then, of course, you know, we will have the closing remarks and the next steps, because I'm sure we all want to know what we what will we be doing with these insights that we garnered today and maybe how else you can become involved with the process as well as we go forward with other consultations. So it's two minutes. We're already almost one minute out. So. Please respond to, to the poll. And as my colleagues are aware, my, my panelists will respond live. Sustainable development, are our higher education institutions addressing the climate crisis and promoting sustainable development in the region? I am going to begin with Dania. I do believe more could be done, even though it's talked about, but I don't think it's promoted enough. Um, something as simple as the three R's, recycle, reuse, and reduce and also looking into renewable energy sources. Um, I think that is something that, again, is not talked about enough. So if we could promote it more, get more people aware of it and understand how important this situation is, not only to our environment, but to us as well. Thank you for that. Ariel? I definitely agree more can be done in terms of getting students aware of what the issue is 
getting them involved in the issues and creating initiatives for students to get involved in climate the climate crisis. All right, thank you. Janice. I do think more can be done, especially that there's so many ideas within the university space of persons wanting to contribute and also just to have a general sense of heightening awareness about climate change. Sometimes the only time we hear about climate change is when the day is extremely hot. There should be resources all over campus so that students can have access to it and to create a sense of urgency because I do believe that sometimes the only thing that climate change will affect the older generation, but it's happening now. So greater need of urgency should be emphasized on it. Additionally, even when within the classroom settings, you still have space for room for improvement regarding some of the materials that has been used, some of the equipment and how well we use our energy and use different like renewable energy sources. So I do believe that there's area for improvement, especially within the Caribbean, because we are a small island developing state and we feel the impact of climate change greater than any other places or any other part of the world. So therefore, we should be at the head leading for this. There even probably should be a institution that focuses specifically on sustainable development and climate change because at the end of the day, if we aren't leading this are championing this cause for climate change, then most of the impact that is happening will affect us, but there won't be anything, there won't be any measures in place to mitigate this. So we have to take charge of that in that regards. All right. So we're talking about awareness and providing systems uh, that will help to mitigate um, the climate crisis as well as to advance sustainable development. Zaka. Um, in that regard, um, I think this is a cause that is well understood within our university. Um, you know, the natural sciences and ecology are, are, are very much, you know, um, forward thinking and, and produce a lot of research in, in that regard. Like, you have pretty good labs. Um, just recently, last year, uh, Martinique, the, the volcanoes in the mountains of the northern part of Martinique were recognized as as part of the World Heritage as a World Heritage site by UNESCO, um, and the scientific project was led by people from the university. But it's still kind of an exception. I think in a lot of policy making outside of this one project, you know, you know, doing this 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 uh, being a candidate for for being recognized as a World Heritage site. In terms of policy making regarding, you know, energy conservation, um, uh, switching to what more renewable, you know, energy production means, uh, regarding, you know, all the risks that we face uh, that that will increase uh, with with climate change, um, I think there's kind of a little disconnect within the knowledge or the solutions or the ideations that happens within the university and the policy making. Uh, um, you know, uh, in our territory. So I think that also we need to see higher education as an asset for policy making, not just as, you know, a separate part, you know, we, we, we do science, we do, uh, we promote, we create scholars and academics and, and people who produce knowledge and it is just there to be pretty. Um, you actually have a university that should be uh, connected to how you do uh, your policy making. And I think there's a slight disconnect here, um, at least in, 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 our, in our countries. Right. I, there is an, I agree. There is definitely a slight disconnect. But as you also mentioned, Zaka, we have to use uh, the resources that we have within our institutions to see how it is that we can promote um, more sustainable development strategies and um, of, of, as well avert the climate crisis to the extent that we can. And I would also add that we should use the resources that we have to hold these um, these industrialized nations accountable for the harm that they're causing to SIDS nations, like what we have in the region. So it's another thing that we definitely need to do as well. Uh, Miguel, to round out this aspect, how do you think our universities can, oh, well, do you think they need to do more to promote sustainable development and to mitigate the climate crisis? Of course, I agree with 
the interventions of my previous colleagues, I think it's important. It's a, a task that we, we owe our cli the climate in our Caribbean. We are islands in the Caribbean. Uh, we are already suffering, as, and as time goes by, we will be suffering even more serious consequences of climate change. So, of course, we need to see this as a task and something that we need to start working on immediately. We can't just... Sometimes we talk, too, we talk a lot and we don't do any actions in terms of climate. Uh, we have to implement policies and generate cultures in, in the knowledge on a topic where we only see when there is a disaster of a great magnitude. However, it has a perspective on time that will give us a bill when there is um, when climate change worsens in the Caribbean. It's important that universities become a center for knowledge, for investigation, and for the promotion of the importance, not just of what we can do to prevent, but also how much we should be generating in terms of renewable energy, the correct use of resources that we now have for fossils and that can allow a culture. In our country, we have the life task for looking after climate. Of course, this includes the universities and the students so that we can all be joining together in the fight against climate change. Universities are important for this task because they can carry out research, they can generate policies in many cases for environmental problems that our countries may have. All right, thank you so much, uh, Miguel. So we are going to go right into our poll, um, our final poll for this um, consultation, which looks at how does our universities help to address social challenges. Can the poll be launched now, please? What is the role of higher education in addressing and transforming the social challenges of the Caribbean? And while the poll is being done, because we are, we note that our translators will leave at four. And while I do speak Spanish, I may not be as fluent as I would want to be to be able to translate um, for my colleague Miguel. I am going to ask you, Miguel, to go ahead and to respond to this question right now. We want to ensure that you are able to fully participate before our interpreters have to go. So we'd love to have your answer now. What is the role of higher education in addressing and transforming the social challenges of the Caribbean? Miguel? I believe the connecting thread of this space has been to debate about the polemics of higher education and the focus of education in Latin America, especially in Caribbean in this case. This is fundamental. We can't see higher education universities just as an isolated space within university. Universities have to be socially responsible for the environment that they are, where they're influencing a society in general because they're part of society they have a responsibility to generate science and investigation um, and professionals of society it has to have that multi uh, that cross-discipline plenary focus and they can provide solutions for many of society's problems, generating policies through study student investigation. In many cases, student investigation um, sponsors pre- and post-degree studies to allow universities 
to give solutions or give investigations that can lead to solutions and answer to problems in their surroundings, social surroundings. It could be the university in social surroundings or the day to day um, in their families and communities. I think it's important to understand that university is a point of um, to join society that is always contributing to science, innovation, culture, policies, uh, the political life and political life plays an important role in further education, higher education and for to us as students, we can't see this in isolation. And the, in the aspects we have debated, we need to see this as a commitment. University has to answer to social dynamics of Latin America and the Caribbean. It has to answer to the social dynamics uh, of the workers or the working class, intellectuals, students, men and women of uh, in general in society. All right. And because I want you to get your last word in before the, the, the translator goes, I am going to ask you, to, I'm going to give you your last question now as well, which is in 20 seconds or less, um, what do you see for the future of higher education? When, you, when you're out of higher education and you look back, what would you like to see? What would you, what would you be able to, 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 to reflect on? So um, what would you like to see for higher education in the future? Or let me read the question as it says it here. What do you see as the future for higher education in your country or region? Thank you. I believe... First of all, uh, we never leave higher ed education after postgraduate. When you finish higher education, there there is more to follow. So you need to see it as something continuous. With, uh, maybe not if not in the university environment, but in our works in the future, we will have the opportunity to carry on learning. Uh, from the university in terms of postgraduate specializations, postgraduates, doctorates, PhDs, and the opportunities we may have. So when we leave higher education, we should remain in an important academic formation that allows us to carry on researching, investigating, and um, Support, uh, in giving an input to the country in the development of social policies. Uh, I think it's important that when we are finishing our training, we need to be able to achieve higher academic academic aims for society. Sorry about that. All right. Thank you, Miguel. And just in case you leave, um, we want to thank you um, on behalf of the planning committee um, of the for the consultation to have you here presenting Cuba and students of the Spanish speaking Caribbean. It was great to have you. All right. So for my for the rest of my panelists, you will be doing a similar exercise where I want you to answer the question, the first question in the poll, which is how do you think our universities can or should be helping to solve um, social challenges of the region or of the country? And then I also want you to give your closing statement as well in um, what's the future of higher education when you think about it in totality, everything that you've talked about earlier and even things that you haven't mentioned yet, and we think about it in, in that context, what do you want to see for higher education in your country and in your region? I'm gonna give you just a second to mull it over because I know it's two things in one and it's a, it's a bit much. And then I'm going to start with Dania. Um, in terms of social challenges, I would say just bringing awareness into the colleges and the universities, higher education institutions. 
um, because at the end of the day, we are the generations going into the world with these social challenges. So we have to be aware of it and also practicing and teaching us like different ways to handle it because we might not be able to solve everything, but we might be able to find temporary solutions. And in terms of the future for higher education, I would just like to see unity, not only in the structures in our schools, but also with, between the Caribbean and the Latin American countries, just unison in general, from the smallest countries to everywhere so that we can have more opportunities available for the students and for the governments in the countries as well. Thank you so much. Ariel? I think our universities help in addressing social challenges is by providing a platform for research, a platform for others to hear about perspectives from their peers and classmates, as well as expressing their own opinions. And I think for the future, I just hope that higher education, everyone has access to higher education, all students, all persons. Need I say, I hope it isn't an option, but a necessity. Students see it as a necessity in improving their livelihood. Thank you so much, Ariel. Geneve? I do hope that the university space will not only be just for students to come and to get an education, but we see real transformation within the different sectors based on their experience and what they would have learned in the university space and to see how that can be transformed into the society at large and even regionally and globally. I do hope that the higher education space will also provide, will be a tool to further solve different issues that we have as a country, as a society within the Caribbean. And I do also hope that we can use a space to integrate and to gather um, a myriad of ideas to solve issues and also to integrate and to brainstorm and to put the Caribbean and the Latin America at the forefront at the forefront of research and innovation so that we can be better able to navigate the social challenges and the issues that we face as a region. And I think the last question is my last words. So my last word is that I do hope that higher education is not just seen as something for persons who are rich or for persons who are better off, but I do hope that we it can be accessible to all and in doing so we're propelling better for social mobility and for inclusion for not just some sector of society but for everyone so that we can contribute to the educational growth and also for social change within the caribbean within our countries and if we look at it from a wider perspective globally thank you and zaka so I'll do a fusion of the two, uh, two, the two questions. Well, um, in terms of social challenges and the future of higher education in the region, well, I, I hope that higher education, uh, that our different systems uh, serves as, um, as a way to, to, to further regional integration, uh, because precisely to answer to those social challenges or non-social challenges, such, such as you know, environmental challenges, I think we will be much stronger together than divided. Um, in terms of my last words, um, it was uh, a great pleasure actually to uh, spend this afternoon with you. Uh, I learned a lot, and uh, I'm very happy that this, you know, there's just promising minds uh, within our region, and uh, I hope that this dialogue, uh, you know, will will help us um, uh, better develop the region. So, yeah. Thank you, Zaka. And before I give my closing remarks. I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Black, um, Chairman of the Governing Council for UNESCO IELSAC. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. You should let me know, uh, Mr. Black, um, to advise us on the next steps from our consultation. And while he comes and advises us on that, I'm asking you to please complete the evaluation form that's now in the chat has been in the chat for about a minute. I will repost it. We really want to know how you felt about today's consultation, what you'd want to see done differently or better. And to also let us know where we did well. 
Uh, so please fill out the evaluation form in the chat. Mr. Black, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been an excellent interaction. I want to thank you, uh, Christina. You did a fantastic job. I want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank persons who participated by feeling their questions in the, in the chat. And whilst it is that we were not able to respond given the time constraints, we have captured the questions and we will be responding to them directed to you, but also part of this process will see the team members of the working group focusing on the futures of higher education in the Caribbean, preparing a report. And this will speak to some philosophical issues, conceptual issues, you know, a framework that will capture responses and thoughts from Caribbean thinkers across the language spectrum, spectra and then feeding into this report that will then move on through um, ESALC and onto some uh, regional discussion that will take place in Cuba uh, during the first week of February, and then in Brasilia, Brazil, uh, March 13 to 15. So this youth dialogue has been critical in, in, in helping us to speak to some of the issues. So Christina, of the Commonwealth Students Association, Head of Advocacy and Partnerships. I wanna thank you so much. You did a fantastic job. Um, your, your, your representation in student fora globally and regionally, and the experience that you have gained spoke positively and contributed significantly to your leadership of this discussion this afternoon. And so thank you so much uh, to you, Geneve. I want to thank you for your contributions. I want to thank you for, for bringing to bear and reflecting, as you have said in your own words, your purpose, which is grounded in service, volunteering, orchestrating impactful programs. Uh, you have participated in student leadership in the University of the West Indies and also in, in Women Leadership Fora. Thank you so much for your contribution. I want to thank uh, Miguel Machado, uh, president of Oakley. I want to thank you, Miguel, and I and I know you. Uh, what's his name? Muy poquino, pequeño, pequeño, whatever it is, but small, little bit of English, eh? I want to thank and acknowledge your role this this afternoon. Thank you um, as a as president of Oakley. You have represented that group well. Member of the National Secretariat of Cuban University Students. Thank you. All the very best as you pursue your medical education and I wish for you every success. Donia, College Ambassador for the Barbados Community College, thank you so much. Um, you have represented um, your, your institution and your certain Ariel, thank you. You have represented Grenada and the TA Marshall Community College very well. And I acknowledge your work as a member of the Student Executive Council and your volunteering with retired persons and as well with small animals, eh? the love of your life, I suppose, the passion there. But thank you so much. Uh, all the best as you debate and your participation in STEM. Uh, Zaka, I salute you. Thank you for joining um, with each of you. I know that the notice would have been short and tight, but you represented so very well. I appreciate your emphasis on nationalism, identities in Martinique and Guadeloupe. And certainly I understand why that is. And so you, you have brought something from that context and we do appreciate. I think that for this afternoon, we have been able to secure the voices of, of persons in very important contexts: Cuba, uh, Martinique, Grenada, uh, Barbados, uh, Jamaica, and then certainly Christina with that sense of the, the, the region that you carry. As I noted, there will be a meeting in, in Havana, Cuba, uh, the 5th and the 7th, uh, the 14th International Congress of Higher Education. Um, so we will be there. We will be debating the, these papers that will be um, tabled before the delegates so that we can share these uh, at the regional conference, as I noted, to be held in Brasilia, Brazil. All of this, UNESCO ESALC, 
partners here, Jamaica Tertiary Education Commission, Grenada National Accreditation Board, uh, Mercedes, um, thank you so much for your facilitation from Cuba, Julia um, from ESALC. Um, we, we, we just acknowledge the work. We thank you all as we continue to struggle, continue to fight to ensure a relevant future for higher education in the Caribbean. We have to work to it. And the voice of the youth is critical in all of this. We have covered many issues and we have done so very well. Thank you so much. You have enriched our report. Thank you. Back to you, Christine. Thank you all so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that comprehensive thank you. I'm sure my <laughs> panelists agree. Um, I'm sure we didn't expect that kind of thank you, but it's well received, Mr. Black. And it's the, the ability and opportunity to engage in this manner with our colleagues from across the region. We want to thank UNESCO ILSAC for this opportunity. And we look forward to more meaningful engagement of this kind as we look at the conference that will be happening uh, in February in Havana, as well as the regional conference in Brazil in March. It was my absolute pleasure being the moderator this afternoon. Uh, the Commonwealth Students Association also extended thanks for being involved in this small, but we would like to say important way. And we wish all of our audience uh, this afternoon a pleasant, a pleasant rest of day. And once again, thank you. And we say in Jamaica, big up everyone. Thanks again. Yes. Complete evaluation. Thank you. <laughs> Complete evaluation.